Summary of Before We Were Yours by Lisa Wingate A person who doesn't want to be named says that the story starts on a hot summer night in Baltimore, Maryland, in 1939, in a room she'll never see. Christine, a young, attractive woman, is screaming and sweating on a hospital bed while surrounded by nurses. Christine gives birth to a stillborn daughter, but she is on so many drugs that she can't understand what is going on. A doctor walks out to where Christine's father is waiting for news with bated breath. The doctor tells the man that Christine's daughter died at birth and that Christine will never be able to carry a baby to full term safely. The man is sad and says that Christine is his only child and that he and his wife had been looking forward to having grandchildren in the house. The doctor gets down on one knee and tells the man that there is a woman in Memphis who can help. Avery Stafford is getting ready to make a public appearance with her father, Senator Wells Stafford, at a nursing home. As they pull up to the nursing home, the two are alone in a limo. Avery thinks about why she's back home in Aiken, South Carolina. Her father has been diagnosed with cancer, and if it gets worse, he might have to step down from his job in the U.S. Senate. Avery has been called home to train to take his place. This is bad because it means she has to live a few hours away from her fiancé, Elliot. Avery and Wells smile and take pictures with their political supporters at the nursing home. As they sit on the stage and listen to the woman's life story, whose 100th birthday they are celebrating, Avery notices an older woman standing alone outside. When the people inside start singing happy birthday, the old woman slowly turns around and starts walking back to the facility. Avery is clearly distracted by the sight of the woman, so her father's assistant, Leslie, tells her to pay attention so the cameras don't catch her looking distracted. The old woman Avery was watching suddenly grabs his wrist and asks, Fern? A nurse quickly comes up and tries to lead the woman, whom Avery calls May Crandall, away. Back at her parents' house, Avery calls Elliot and gets ready to take a family Christmas picture, even though it's July. Avery's mother, Honeybee Stafford, is worried that Wells's hair will thin because of his new cancer treatment. Avery has fun with her sister Allison's daughter Courtney until the nursing home she went to earlier calls her. The nurse tells Avery over the phone that May was found with the dragonfly bracelet that Avery lost at her birthday party. Avery loves the bracelet because it used to belong to her grandmother, Judy Stafford, before Judy had to go to a high-end nursing home for care for people with dementia. Avery doesn't send Leslie's intern, Ian, to get the bracelet because she also wants to find out more about May. Avery walks into May's room at the nursing home and sees an old picture of a couple. Avery takes a picture of the woman in the picture because she looks a lot like Judy. May walks in at that moment and starts talking to Avery. May says that Judy Stafford is a member of her bridge club, but she won't answer any questions about the picture. Avery goes to see Judy to ask her what's going on with May and the picture. When Avery shows the picture to Judy, Judy lightly touches it and says, Queenie. Judy also tells Avery in a mysterious way that no one can ever know about Arcadia, but she doesn't explain what she means by this. Avery can't get rid of the feeling that her grandmother is connected to May Crandall in some way, so she decides to look through Judy's account books and papers. Avery finds the phone number for someone named Trent Turner in one of Judy's notebooks. Avery doesn't know the name, but she calls and finds out that Trent works in real estate on Edisto Island, where Judy owns a beach house. After doing some more research, Avery finds out that Trent is really Trent Turner Sr., but that he died six months ago and left the business to his grandson, Trent Turner III. Trent Turner III calls Avery and says that he has some papers that his grandfather wanted Judy to have, but he won't give them to Avery. Avery goes to Trent's house to find out what's going on, but he still won't give her the papers. Avery goes to her grandmother's cottage and finds an old typewriter. She takes out the tape and figures out the last few lines of the last letter that was typed on it. Judy was trying to find out more about the Tennessee Children's Home Society as the lines show, TCHS. Avery calls Trent because she is confused and afraid that her family has a dark secret. Trent gives Avery the papers, which turn out to be the record of when Chad Arthur Foss was adopted. 
Avery is still confused, so Trent suggests that they look through the TCHS files in his grandfather's office. But just then, Trent's son Jonah comes out of his room, and Avery walks away. She is attracted to both Trent and Jonah, but she tries to forget about them by thinking about Elliot. Avery and Trent go to Trent's grandfather's office the next day. On the way, Avery reads an article about Georgia Tan, who ran the TCHS and abused many of the children who went through the system. Many of these children were taken from poor families. Trent finds out in the office that one of these children was his grandfather, but Avery is left with more questions than answers. She decides to go back to May, so Trent goes with her. May tells Trent that she knew his grandfather when they were both at the TCHS orphanage when Trent Turner Jr. was still called Stevie. Avery doesn't believe May when she says that Judy was just writing an article about the TCHS. Avery starts to rethink her whole life when she finds out that her family might have a dark secret. This includes her engagement to Elliot, who isn't very passionate about her. Trent calls Avery and invites her to lunch one day. Avery is on her way to meet him when she sees a taxi in Judy's driveway. She decides to check it out. The driver says that Judy has always been picked up on Thursdays. This has been the case for years. Avery doesn't know where the taxi is going, so she asks Trent to go with her to find out. The taxi takes them to an Augusta house. Trent and Avery knock on the door, but no one answers, so they just walk in. Inside, Avery sees an old photo of her grandmother with three other women. They are all wearing dragonfly bracelets that match her grandmother's. When they hear a man outside, they go to meet him. The man gives them to his mother, Hootsie, who lives in the house and takes care of it. Judy was writing a memoir, and Hootsie tells Avery the beginning of it. In it, Judy says that she is the daughter of Queenie and Briny Foss and that she was kidnapped and sold to Christine's father to replace her stillborn daughter. The other women in the picture are Judy's sisters. May is one of them. In 1939, when Real Foss is 12 years old, her parents, Queenie and Briny, take her and her four younger siblings, Camelia, Lark, Fern, and Gabion, to the hospital so that Queenie can give birth to twins. Rill has to take care of Camelia, Lark, Fern, and Gabion all by herself. Old Zed, a family friend, comes back from the hospital to tell Rill that the twins died and to give Silas to her. Silas will take care of the kids until Queenie and Briny can come back. After Zed leaves, a group of policemen get on the family's shanty boat and demand that Rill and her siblings go with them to see their parents. Rill agrees to go and tries to tell Silas to go tell Zed by looking at him. The police bring the children to Memphis, where their boat is docked. They are given to Georgia Tan, who already has two kids with her, whom she calls Stevie and Sherry. The seven kids are taken to an orphanage that is run by Ida Murphy and Mrs. Polnick. Tan gives Rill and her siblings new names when they go to the orphanage. Their new names are May, Iris, Bonnie, Beth, and Robbie Weathers. They are sent to sleep in the basement until Murphy decides they are good enough to move upstairs. Even though they are scared, the five Foss children are happy to be together. Mr. Riggs, who takes care of the grounds, comes in the middle of the night and puts peppermints on their pillows. Soon after, the four Foss children with curly blonde hair, Rill, Lark, Fern, and Gabion, are dressed up and brought to a viewing for potential adopters. Couples quickly notice the three younger children, but Rill is mostly left alone and tries to keep an eye on her little sister and brother. At the end of the viewing, though, the couple who has been playing with Gabion doesn't want to let him go. Even though Rill tried to tell them that he already has parents, Georgia Tan lets them pay for him right away. Rill is shocked by what happened, so she keeps quiet on the way back to the orphanage. When they get back, Rill looks for Camelia right away. She finds her crying near a bush. Rill asks Camelia what's going on, but she won't say. Rill opens Camelia's hand and sees peppermints inside. When Rill sees this, she realizes that Mr. Riggs raped Camelia and tries to calm her down. Camelia screams and fights back during the next bath. She goes away and doesn't come back. 
A few days later, when Real was still upset about losing Gabian and Camellia, she saw a couple take Lark away. Real tries to stop this from happening, but Miss Dodd pushes her away. Real tells Miss Dodd what happened, and Miss Dodd says she'll help, but Murphy catches her. Real is stuck in the basement and can't get out, so Fern is all by herself. When Real is finally let back up, she learns that Fern was adopted, which makes her feel very sad. A few days later, though, Darren and Victoria Severe, the same people who took in Fern, take in Real because Fern won't stop crying for her. Real decides that it's time for them to run away and find their parents after she finds Fern again. A young woman named Arnie helps them do this because she knows how to get to the Mississippi River. When Real and Fern find their family's shanty boat, they find out that their Aunt Queenie has died and that their Uncle Briny has turned into an alcoholic. One night, Briny gets drunk and throws the boat into the river during a storm. A floating tree hits the boat and breaks it. Real decides that she needs to take Fern back to their adoptive family, where they will be safe. Avery finds out in the present day that Queenie's twins were not stillborn, but were instead sold to different families. Real and Fern were able to talk to Judy and Lark again as adults. Even though they didn't tell anyone about their relationship, the two women spent as much time as they could in the Augusta house together. Avery decides to bring together Judy and May, the only two Foss children who are still alive, and tell her parents about the secret. Wells is shocked when he finds out, but he agrees that the sisters should be brought back together. So, the Staffords make plans for May to move into the same place as Judy, where the two sisters can spend as much time as possible with each other. Avery's life changes when she learns the truth about her family's past. She quits her job as a lawyer for a senior rights pack and breaks up with her boyfriend Elliot to start a new relationship with Trent. About the author Lisa Wingate was born in Germany in 1965, but after her family moved to the United States, she grew up in Oklahoma. When Wingate was in first grade, her teacher told her that one day her name would be in a magazine. This made her want to write. From then on, Wingate's love of telling stories and writing turned into a strong desire to do both. She went on to get a BA in Technical English, but she didn't start writing novels until 2001, when her first book, Tending Roses, came out. Since then, Wingate has written more than 30 novels and novellas, which have been published all over the world in over 40 different languages. Wingate's works have also been nominated for and won a number of awards, such as the Pat Conroy Southern Book Prize, the Oklahoma Book Award, and the Goodreads Choice Award. Before We Were Yours is Wingate's most famous and well-liked book. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for more than a year and won the 2017 Goodreads Choice Award for Historical Fiction. Wingate married Sam in 1988, and the two of them now have two sons. Wingate lives in Texas on the farm that her family owns. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.